Welcome back to another edition of the Build Show podcast. I have a rock star in the building science world today as a guest. And we're going to get into one of my favorite topics, which is the building envelope. We got a lot of good stuff for you today. Today's build show all about the building envelope. Let's get going. All right, guys, let me introduce you to my friend, David Nicastro. David is an absolute rock star in the building science world. And David, I'm not even sure I totally understand the depth of your background. I've heard you speak on multiple occasions. Uh, I visited with you at the durability lab that you're in partnership with at the University of Texas. I've read your papers, I've seen your research, but before we get into the building envelope, give me just a little bit of your background. I, th I find it fascinating to hear how people have ended up where they are. Well, interestingly, I read an article when I was in high school in Smithsonian Magazine about forensic engineering, and it sounded really cool to me, <laughs> and I've never done anything since then. So my first degree was in math, which okay. is a great foundation for the engineering failures that we investigate. For sure. And then I got a degree in uh, engineering here at the University of Texas. All right. We got a Texas and alum with us. That's right. And then I pretty much tried to stay here in Austin, a few diversions, but uh, most of this time, uh, I've spent a lot more time in Austin than anywhere else. Yeah. But uh, then I worked for law engineering out of school and did that for nearly a decade, was a principal there, and then I left and took the clients and people and <laughs> projects and started uh, engineering diagnostics, which I still own in Houston. That, okay. was, that was in Houston. And building diagnostics in Austin. Now we have offices in Kansas City, Mexico City, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, and headquarters is here in Austin. Wow, you're all over the place. That's right. And building diagnostics, tell me the breadth of different things you work on, because you work on both failures and forensics, but you also work on uh, making sure buildings get built correctly too, and, right? And we charge the same unit rates to prevent it or fix it afterwards. So but surprisingly, it's less uh, money probably to do it correctly to begin with, isn't it? Vastly less. So <laughs> a classic war story that I love to tell people is there was a condominium project uh, that was designed and uh, the design team asked me to peer review it. I gave them a quote of $5,000 to review the building envelope, drawings and specifications. Uh -huh. That was not in the budget, was not approved. Then, so they didn't hire you. They did not. Oh, then no. the builder came to me and uh, wanted a quote to do monitoring and literally said to me, this is the worst set of drawings I've ever seen and I need some help. So we <sighs> gave them a quote to do review and then hand, help them through the construction phase. And that quote was for $20,000. And they said, sorry, that's not in the budget. And it was turned <laughs> down. Then it went into litigation and I earned an average of $30,000 a month for years off oh, that one project. Brilliant. And we have, um, you know, 1100 projects. <laughs> I mean, we, um, you know, the, the active projects are in the hundreds on any given day. Um, but a, a litigation one is so much more lucrative. And mm. that's actually really important to understand that that's what funds all the academic research that right. we do. We take a portion of the proceeds from a very lucrative failure investigation business mm -hmm. and plow that back into our mission to educate people about what caused those failures. Yep. So we do vast amounts of research testing, public speaking, and, and things like this. So this is all part of our mission to, um, our, our motto is make new mistakes. Yeah. Right? There's no reason anybody should repeat what has happened to oh. somebody else before, except for ignorance. And so, so we true. try to explain what we've learned and, and we would never run out if people just gave us the new ones. We see new stuff all the time too, <laughs> but there's so many that are just rotted wood, you know, that's it. Going you know, back to the basics. Corrosion, rotted wood, it's all about the water. <laughs> David, I've quoted you on multiple times on my videos, on presentations. Uh, you probably said, I probably heard you say this for the first time, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago. If it can't dry, it's going to die. 
Yes. And I absolutely love that quote because there's so much wisdom in just a few words. Right. Uh, give us the, the longer version of that. Right. Well, I'm not sure it's original. I probably <laughs> stole it from me, but I don't remember. It's long, long time ago. I'm going to say I it heard. was you, David. How about well, that? Maybe it was. I have some original stuff, but, <laughs> I, I, but I honestly don't know where I got that line. But, it, you know, it's popular, but it the, it is the reality of what we see all the time. It mm -hmm. is what I... The, when I only can teach somebody one thing, like a building engineer who's doing inspections of their properties, and he's like, I don't know, when, when should I call you? I say, if you see a place where water can get in and you don't see how it can come out, that's probably a major problem. That's you right. probably have trapped water and it's doing something bad. Mm -hmm. The best thing water can do is come to the interior because then it gets dealt with. If it gets on somebody's floor or ceiling tile or drywall, turns to mold, everybody gets excited and then they do something. But what they don't see mm -hmm. is the major property damage is when it's stuck inside walls or roofs, wetting insulation, rotting, corroding, fasteners are completely decayed. And, and then it goes from cosmetic or IAQ into structural failures at that point. Right. Where you might have been able to seal it with a tube of sealant mm -hmm. at the beginning. Yep. Now we're reskinning whole buildings yeah. because of the water damage that's mm -hmm. occurred. Uh, the water damage is always harder to correct and more costly than the source of the leaks. Yep. You could fix every leak on a building for a small amount of money. But... The consequential damage or resultant damage from it is enormous and totally. always costs far more. Just the drywall replacement is far more expensive than anything we do on the outside of the building. Totally true. Totally true. Let's talk building enclosures, David, because I consider you an expert in the enclosure. You've seen every different flavor, variety of skin and envelope. Um, maybe first we should just we should define the terms for a second, right? You know, mm -hmm. when, we th when we think about buildings or when I talk about buildings, most of the time I'm thinking residential, which then means most of the time I'm thinking wood framed. And so the wood is the structure. Uh, and then there's this envelope uh, that's a part of that wood structure. Can you kind of uh, break that down for me? Yes. Well, one way that I heard the building envelope described very early in my career, and I still think that's the best description I've heard, is as a complex filter. So it, it's complex because it lets some things through, mm -hmm. like daylight. Okay. It keeps some things out, hopefully. I mean, a well-designed one, right? Like rainwater. Yep. And then it lets other things through in a controlled manner. Vapor, mm -hmm. uh, air exchanges. And so this building envelope, it cannot just hmm. be a metal aluminum foil wrap, right? right? right. It, it, that, Saran wrap. Yeah, it, it, or either <laughs> or, or one, either one, right? It, it has to be this complex filter that's controlling exactly what you want to come in and what you want to keep out. And that's sometimes it's by proportions. Mm -hmm. So we want the light, but not the heat. Yep. We want, you know, or in some markets, you want the heat because it's, uh, you know, a that heating solar heat gain is important for, that, for some people. That's very important in, yeah. in some climates. But mm -hmm. down here, we've got plenty of heat. Yeah, we don't need <laughs> any more of that. It's cooling night and day down yep. here, almost 365 days a year. Yep. So we want to ex expel that heat or mm -hmm. repel it. So then uh, that building envelope is usually comprised of, let's say, some kind of wood structure, uh, insulation that might be inboard or outboard of that structure. Uh, and then we've got all kinds of membranes and skins and ways to keep uh, those four things that we're, we're trying to keep out, which is, you know, typically bulk water and then airflow, and then vapor flow, and then heat transfer. Mm -hmm. And then what I've learned from you and other good building scientists is that a good cladding system on the outside of the building is mainly a UV blocker um, and doesn't necessarily have to keep everything out of the enclosure. Uh, you know, a, a for instance, uh, a really good uh, open joint rain screen can be a terrific cladding on a building mm -hmm. as long as everything behind it uh, is kept nice and dark. Uh, mm -hmm. meaning all those building envelopes. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about what UV damage can do to building products, uh, the things that we build our houses out of. Yes, there are very few uh, of the materials that are inside the wall assembly that have UV resistance. They, they usually have fairly short 
UV resistance. Mm -hmm. There are some materials that have UV resistance for uh, the duration, and those are used between behind, for instance, a true rain screen wall where mm -hmm. you're going to have open joints and sunlight is going to penetrate into that. So that's a membrane that has to have it. So things like an aluminized um, membrane. Yep. There, there are certainly some pure silicones can do that, mm -hmm. but uh, the others have a a, an expiration date mm -hmm. they come with a published value for how long they can be exposed to uv before they have to be protected from yep. it and um the you think about it that's a that single number that's published on the data sheet you should be very suspicious of mm -hmm. think about the calculus that had to go into the marketing department deciding what value to put on there right. so they got several things they have to do they got to compete so other people have a longer one so mm -hmm. that's you know that's the arms race though they each bump theirs up oh, until it's 60 days or mine exactly so they'll claim 90 and they just 20 they and it keeps going right and uh -huh. so that snowballs but also they are using a single value for whether you're in miami or detroit mm -hmm. and you have very different solar uh exposure in Big those time. environments uh they have a single value whether you're on the north side of the building or the south side of the building mm -hmm. so they're somehow is it an average is it a minimum is it a maximum right. you don't know and yeah. if you call your tech rep and ask they like, i don't know it's just you know it's you, a number it's, it's what we're given and that's how long you have and uh and yet we still see things exposed longer than that we have mm -hmm. litigation in process right now we have cases that are in litigation where um you know, Google Earth is an amazing tool. You can look at things being built. A lot of our projects, you can watch exactly how they're right? being built wow. on satellite From images. Google Earth. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. So and you could see, for instance, that roof membrane that says it's supposed to have 30 days till and, it's covered. And we know the date it was put on and we know the date it was covered. Whoa, yeah. That's wild to yeah. think about. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So that's one tool in the toolbox. But I mean, it, we're only doing that because it's damaged. We're, right. we're looking at things that are in some straight of failure. And then we watch. Or, but I've done it in real time. I get a call from a client. They give me the address. And, you know, while they're talking to me, I type it and they're telling me, you know, I think it's a uh, concrete cladding. I'm going, nope, <laughs> it's a insulated <laughs> concrete form. They're like, how, how do you know that? I'm, I'm watching it be built I'm right now on, on my Google screen. Right now. Yeah, I'm watching them build it. And you can <laughs> see, I can tell you the brand names because you can see the colors wow. and everything else. So, so uh, that that's nice in this digital era. We can uh, we can extract a lot from the Internet about buildings and how they were built and everything about who did what for sure um not everything I mean, there's still there's always some mysteries that's kind of what jazzes us is the stuff we can't figure out and, yeah. and sustains through all the investigation and you're at the end of them we're still going never could figure out how that got there you know yeah. why somebody would have done that yeah you know? but uh, um anyway so the uv is um, the most damaging thing, but not the only damaging thing mm -hmm. on cladding or behind cladding materials. Ozone is also destructive and that's going to get there no matter what you do. So materials have to be resist resistant to the environmental factors that mm -hmm. are there. And those are um, sunlight, water, oxygen or ozone. Mm -hmm. And there are other threats to them. Um, but UV is uh, an extremely important one. And um, one of the things we'd been researching at the Durability Lab was um, continuation of damage mm -hmm. after exposure. There, there is yeah. now one paper that has been published on that. We, we not, did not publish it. We, have, uh, we were aware of that research and data when we started our study. Um, we, what we've published is the tip of the iceberg we have published what 50 articles there's so much more that we have not gotten to publish. so much to do and so uh i'd like to but uh, david can you explain verbally what the what's happening with that testing not everyone who's watching this knows about the uh u2 durability lab mm -hmm. and uh you know you've got some outdoor uv testing for all kinds of different um mm -hmm. uh, wrb products let's call it is that is that a fair term for it mm -hmm. uh where you've got basically a test wall of different products that have been exposed to the sun and then 
if I remember correctly, once that product hit its uh, manufacturer's tech sheet, uh, cover date, then you cover those products with something like a you know a cement board, and then you've taken some of those apart later to say, okay, now that we've had mm-hmm. whatever six months of uh, UV damage, which the manufacturer said was okay, we've covered them for two or three years. Then when you uncover them, what kinds of things did you find? Did that damage stop, or did that damage kind of continue to degrade that material even though it was in the shade? Right. So let's break that down a little bit. So first of all, the uh, our company, Building Diagnostics, that, that's our for-profit company. Okay. We also own the Durability Lab, which is a nonprofit institution that we use for doing research, testing, public speaking, and other things. Got it. That uh, research is done in partnership with the University of Texas. So we have an outdoor weathering site at UT, mm-hmm. really just a few hundred yards from this building. That's so right, we, right over yeah, here. That's we could, right. We could walk there right now. Um, and we also have indoor lab facilities there. Um, the outdoor weathering site gets all the attention. I mean, that's what you videotaped before, mm-hmm. right? There's blogs and blogs and things about it because it's um, – it's very graphic. People can walk up and see it. They can they can touch it, but don't. Don't touch it. Everything is labeled, please do not yeah. touch, because finger oils are really not good for our specimens. Yeah. And that's not what we're testing. And uh, we're looking for how things break down. If you mm-hmm. touch them, it influences it. But it makes it's, sense. it's so tempting. He's like, is that? <laughs> you <know, laughs> want to scratch it or touch it. So, um, but it's, uh, it's, looks nice and so people want to go out there and, and see those specimens but that's again that's just tip of the iceberg that's just one part of what you guys are doing that's right we test structural things we, we do stuff in the hydrology building we do thermal things over in, in thermal chambers um, we work in um, with the ferguson structural lab on things like durability bearing pads that hmm. are used in parking garages so our company investigates failures of everything from the foundation of the roof and okay. so um, we're interested in the behavior of materials in all types of construction but the building envelope is by far the sar- largest category of failures hmm. so when i went into failure you in, know, in, uh, investigations. When I studied forensic engineering, it was not at all clear that I was going to be working on building envelopes. That's mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. what I was directed toward. I, I was studying things like fracture mechanics and the behavior of materials. Well, what happens every day, the number one source of failure is related to water. Yep. And then number two is gravity and stuff falling off of buildings, hmm. which you would wear a hard hat all the time if you saw the number of failures we investigated are you just serious every day it's, it's, it's walking down the street in austin you should be wearing a hard hat yeah we that's really a big problem this <laughs> stuff Yikes. falls off of buildings holy cow um and, and then others are, are way below that so those are way up that that makes up probably 80 percent of all of our cases yeah, i've always heard that 80 percent of construction defect litigation is water related in some way shape or form yeah so it's it probably is close to that but uh, for us we think of it as uh, maybe 50 percent of all of our cases and okay then you know there's gravity and wind load and you know structural failures make yeah. up a good portion and then there's just the one-off material failure spontaneous glass breakage and things like that that have to be investigated with all the same science tools people yeah. you know that's um, we're really not picky about what it is when it's under a microscope. It's more <laughs> about, you know, how does it, how does it behave? Um, but back to the UV. So the testing that uh, we have, the walls you're talking about are at the University of Texas, J.J. Pickle uh, Research Campus, mm-hmm. not the main campus downtown. Yep. And uh, we built a representative wall of every type of WRB, not every brand. We have on our research, we are exploring over 130 WRB products. Oh my gosh, so many. And they come into the marketplace and some leave or they're tweaked and um, we're you know, gratified that we've actually had some influence of that. We have mm-hmm. caused things to be reformulated based on our research, particularly about UV. So we've already hopefully improved durability for the user because of research but we, we always invite manufacturers or uh, they come uh, from all over and we show them and i also go to them and present research to them and try and work in collaboration with them to um, develop 
good products, but we're not at we're not in the product development business. What right. we're we're looking at is how these things behave, and we give that feedback. They're in the product development business, and I'm really gratified how many of them call me and say, "We're working on this. What do you think?" And we just share what we've seen on on similar things. That's and, really cool. And, and so we're constantly involved with manufacturers on development of products, mm-hmm. but that's part of the public mission right. that it's not we don't do that for profit yep. it's an entirely a consulting thing with them to just try and feedback what we see as failure now on the uv those walls yes we clad them with cement board but only the top half of each specimen so half of each wall is exposed overexposed to uv the cladding goes on the upper half at the manufacturer's published single value so if it says it can be exposed for 90 days after 90 days we cover it with the cement board on the upper half and the the other half is left to uh, basically deteriorate from that overexposure now that does several things Um, as you said we can take off the cladding and, and see behind it so we do that annually okay we've done it for years and years and we take it off and look at how the concealed portion is behaving some of them cannot be removed is that right it's very scary quite a few products after a year the cement board has fused has to the water resistant basically <laughs> yeah so is that a reemulsification where the because these do have some water uh-huh. getting behind them they're intentionally allowed to have uh, rainwater be able to reach the water resistive barrier uh-huh. right it's supposed to be able to take that right. it's not flooding it get but it can get damp from get rainwater and we do that by the top of each of the walls the uh, coping parapet cap that's simulated with a, mm-hmm. a sheet metal coping has a slight gap okay. probably an eighth of an inch between the cement board siding and the metal hmm. instead of lapping it as you would do All right. more than like an inch or two we have a butt joint there and water can seep into that joint wet the back side of the siding hmm. and wet uh, the, the membrane so um you know in, in a good envelope you would separate that siding you would fur it out right that has only recently been required by manufacturers like uh, hardy has uh is and, and still not required everywhere it's a recommendation right. their published technical bulletin says we recommend doing that mm-hmm. it is required by the code in some environments yeah and some i know in the pacific northwest it's code in many areas but you I have read, to have a rain screen yeah i read their tech sheet is saying everybody should be doing this mm-hmm. and we would make it mandatory if we could yep. whether market forces or codes or whatever they, mm-hmm. they can't just say you have to fur it out but they are strongly telling you that you should and if you had a failure and you're cladding was not furred out Mm -hmm. you would have a hard time going back against hardy and saying uh well you should have made it it's like we told you we published a tech bulletin that said best practice is to do that and you didn't follow you opted to not do it so um you know i'm not sure who would be left uh with that holding the back but we know that that we you know we use a hardy platinum that's what we buy locally and, yep. it's, and it's very good product i mean it, it's and it's I very representative i yeah. like it yeah it's good it's great some, in our climate right and we use it for lots of stuff we construct a lot of things out of hardy board because it's readily available and it's a great simulation of concrete so mm-hmm. we use it for concrete decks because it's a lot easier than actually placing concrete for sure <laughs> it is you know it behaves very similarly but when it's over um the wrb now it's representing all sorts of cladding Mm -hmm. um so it's it's you know just standing in for something else that would get constructed after but in the uv experiments it is simply just providing 100 percent guaranteed no uvs getting Mm -hmm. through there right that's a real solid uv definitely black black behind it (laughs) (laughs) so but just the top half and then we watch it deteriorate and then what we can do is look at how the overexposed fails where does it fail first at seams at fastener holes uh at accessories um in the field with blistering and and that informs us of what to look for behind the cladding mm-hmm. assuming we can get it back off it's not you know glued to it or fused as we call it we don't know why but you can't crowbar it off of the thing mm-hmm. on many products we consider that a failure that's that's not a desirable quality yeah. in a product that you can't remove 
the cladding after yeah, it got sticky somehow it wasn't <laughs> sticky when we clad it and then and this isn't just fluid applied we're talking about right this could also be peel and stick products or house wraps as well uh, as kind of thinking it, of three different product it, categories it could be because of their accessories even if the mm-hmm. primary product no product goes on with uh, with only one component there's right. always an ex- at least one accessory right and if you want we can talk about what happens with those accessories but the the important thing for this is that some of the failures we're seeing are in the secondary or accessory products mm-hmm. so they have a liquid applied sealant or a tape and the fusing is happening with those tapes those in places. some cases or the the sealants that are used as fillets um, but they do touch the cladding in fact they are more likely to one of the things that we discovered from this testing is that the larger the specified can't bead or you know the accessory detail is the more likely it is to have damage hmm. and it's it's because of the dimension it is that it is now being it's being impacted by the other materials so while normally with the with the wrb thin uh, thickness is desirable the thicker ones are in our experience better we would love to find thin pro- thinner products that were successful. That would be better for everybody. Mm-hmm. The weight of shipping, everything would cost less, less weight of material. There's, it would just be ideal if you could have a super thin material. However, what we find that correlates with all of our testing success is thicker materials, more rubber, mm-hmm. you know, more body to seal fastener but- shanks. It's it's and, not uh, it's not surprising, right? That uh, you in know, fracture if you, mechanics, if you wore yeah. thicker jeans, that you'd be more uh, protected on the job site, let's say, than some paper thin. <laughs> right, uh, all jeans being on the equal, job. you can make up for a lot of uh, defects in uh-huh. product formulation by being thicker and more of it. Um, not not everything, but yeah, that's common in fracture mechanics. You're mm-hmm. going to arrest a lot of mechanisms if you have more material there. So, th- but thinness is desirable when you get to the detailing Mm -hmm. you put it you think about the most common type of flashing historically maybe today it's shifting to something else but most things use a rubberized asphalt Mm -hmm. peel and stick membrane at the window corner yep and it's drawn as a cad line of Mm -hmm. you know a 90 degree corner and it has no thickness to the (laughs) pencil line (laughs) but in reality it's 40 mils you know, with a facer on it. And, right. then, and then there's two or three layers maybe. To right, because you can't make the whole right. window opening out of one piece. So yep. There's going to be a lap seam somewhere. Now you're 80 mm-hmm. and you get to that inside corner at the sill to jam. And then you got a little pinhole because you're folding it out at origami. Mm-hmm. So you put another piece in and you got three and it's really not a 90 degree corner. You yep. field molded it in there. And so it's maybe a, like a 130 degree <laughs> angle. It's getting it's, thick. Yeah. And then you shove a window into it. And what does it do? You know, it, it hits it like a D9 bulldozer mm-hmm. and scrapes it right into the opening. So we yeah. have lots of photos of from the backside showing the damage to the waterproofing by installing by shoving a window into the hole window that was into too the tight hole. anyways yep that, yeah and so Ugh, um painful. so those accessory materials are where we see a lot of the damage in our cladding mock-ups mm-hmm. um and uh, and but we definitely have some I, I would think that the ones that are failing in the field from the the fusing are liquid applied fluid applied products but they all use an accessory product that's also vulnerable to that and Mm -hmm. so we can get fusing and have gotten fusing off of products that um, are are definitely not fluid applied primary products but they have a fluid component on their accessories sure well even if it's a tape there's yeah there's an adhesive on the back of that tape yeah and it and flows be, and it glues mm, everything it touches not we've just all seen what, some type of rubberized asphalt that's kind of melted and fallen down drool we call that drool drooled out <laughs> mm-hmm. david let's um uh, let's kind of switch to where the rubber meets the road and i'd love to ask you if you're willing mm-hmm. uh, about your house uh, that you built it's been a decade or two ago now right. but i've mm-hmm. i've heard you speak about it and 
Uh, actually, your builder is a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, Ray Tonjes. Ray Tonjes. Give him a terrific, shout out. Terrific, yeah. terrific He was a builder. client of mine. And then I he said. He was. Okay. I didn't oh, know yes. That. And I said, uh, when I build my house, I want you to do it. I, mean, he's just, I didn't know you yet. but He's Ray, such a great guy. He's in, I wasn't building in Texas at that time. He was. He's very knowledgeable and quality. And so. He's uh, top notch. And I'd seen his workmanship. And I said, I want you to build my house. Can he's he's right? now uh, closed his business down and he's working for another builder in town. That's Chris right. Little, which is great to yep. see. Uh, I love seeing some builders of Ray's generation working for other guys too to help pass that knowledge on. And yeah. uh, and we, that's one of the things I love about this podcast and my videos is mm-hmm. passing that wisdom down to that next generation. But mm-hmm. if you're willing, would you walk through your mm-hmm. building envelope at your house? What you did, wh- mm-hmm. you know, what 18 or so years ago when you build it, um, how you kind of decided what you were going to do on your envelope. And then maybe at the, if we still have time at the end, even what you might do differently if you were building that same house today. Okay. So um, another one of my taglines that I, maybe it's original or maybe I stole I'm from right something. I, I, right, what do you got? <laughs> uh, water doesn't come into my house unless I invite it. Oh, I like that. Uh, I don't know if it's original, but I've been saying it for 18 years. And uh, so uh, it's funny because of all the stuff we've researched in my typical wall section is limestone over a good healthy air gap Mm -hmm. the the drainage cavity which is also the drying cavity and then my wrb is two layers of number 15 felt sorry 15 pound felt real 15 pound number 15 they moved the number sign in a one of the many conspiracies out there that was a deliberate attempt to make people not notice they took out a lot of the asphalt, mm-hmm. but you can still get 15 pound felt. And that's actually 15 pounds per square. Is that correct? Uh, is that what was that the weight measure that they were it using? It is a weight measurement and uh, there's 30 pound, mm-hmm. but there are a dozen similar terms. Okay. We have tested all of them at the lab and we built a wall with them from the lowest amount of asphalt to the That's to right, the I most seeing that. with the like a big it, tower of them all it, right and layered and lapped and we put them in the, up in the order of expected failure with the mm. idea that when one of them ripped or shredded and water got in there it wouldn't influence anything below it okay and we got it right except for one is that right yeah there's two that are out of sequence huh. one failed <laughs> earlier than the other and it's like well that wasn't expected and so of course it causes some ex- ex- know, damage effect. below it yeah. but uh otherwise it, it was strictly by weight of asphalt yeah. going up and, yeah. and that's the order that things are failing in but the you and know what about the, sheathing behind that did you use oriented strand board did you use plywood did you use a plywood. specific just plywood mm-hmm. any specific type or thickness of plywood it's cdx okay. all, all of those walls that you see out there are cdx because that's really common i'd say three quarter uh, five eighths half mm, seven sixteenths i'm not sure okay I'm just they're, curious they're all built by contractors uh, we write specifications and have these things built uh, i'm not the specifier necessarily on anything that happens mm-hmm. out there i i uh, um i approve them i see the proposals and and um you know but we have everything we build out there is done by professional builders Mm -hmm. to specifications and it's supposed to be complying with manufacturer specifications makes sense but uh there's a great variability i don't know what that particular one is but i would say um all of the wrb mock-ups that you've seen out there were definitely on cdx plywood and okay. i think it's half inch and uh is there anything to that cdx versus uh using a more uh, broken down product let's say like <laughs> oriented strand board or uh even worse maybe thermoply or something else out there or you know any self-mulching product um <laughs> that, yeah you could i've not heard of that before <laughs> i've heard vertical mulch but not yeah. self-mulching i like that well anything that else is going to be more decay resistant mm-hmm. and uh, i mean or less so uh yep uh, well not every. you could have some things that are even more resistant but plywood by its laminar structure is mm-hmm. pretty resistant yep. and but c dx i don't even think they call it there that's what it was when i was in school they still call it cdx it's Duh. a c face and a d face so you've got yeah. footballs and you've got kind of i think they have not so pretty faces american, on the D side now they got american plywood association 
numbers on them. And oh, I, is that I, right? I, oh, maybe I'm wrong. They just hadn't been age. invented when I was in school, That's so I funny. still call it CDX. But I but, still call it that too. Uh, but uh, you know, all it means is this: you know, the C face is improved, knots are filled, and so forth. But mm -hmm. and the D's pretty rough. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to use what we see as a typical sheathing, mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily when when we talk about residential. Um, you're thinking single family home, but vast majority of the portfolio is multifamily. Right. And they are built quite similarly. Mm -hmm. So it's still wood framing. Yep. Um, two Some by kind of four sheathing. studs, um, wood trusses. Mm -hmm. And then sheathing is a commodity product. It's whatever's mm -hmm. cheapest that day. And yep. it's bought on a weekly basis based on commodity pricing. Yeah. Wood's really high right now. So oh, a lot of builders are going to gypsum sheathing is that right mm -hmm. wow it's cheaper at the moment today you know tomorrow not necessarily yeah what's and the hydric buffer capacity on that gypsum compared to uh some plywood out there i i think a good gypsum with a good glass mat on it is very durable and um it accommodates all the detailing very well so um, i think it's yeah so as long as you're not using it for shear strength basically you're using it as a substrate to attach your water and air barrier maybe yeah, it's better yeah. for fire so mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's typically used in some portion of a building already for mm -hmm. uh, fire safety yep um but uh, the plywood substrate is our normal go-to product for a wall that we're building but mm -hmm. if we're trying to simulate a particular building we'll use the whole wall assembly and actually have those contractors build it so it's like an off-site mock-up they'll right. build uh, a, a section of the building at university of texas <laughs> to to the same specs that they're going to be building on a site love it and um so helpful to do that yeah but we're, we're trying to duplicate reality we're, mm. we're not trying to make something unrealistic yeah. we're trying to simulate everything and then there's various ways of accelerating the testing to get faster feedback feedback mm -hmm. but the construction the detailing the materials throughout we're trying to use what is typical in the built environment yeah. and and common we're, we're not interested in one-off things right. you know, we're trying to replicate what people are going to see and uh but so on my house it is um plywood mm -hmm. not osb yep um because that laminar structure does prevent decay it, or at least it will prolong it, mm -hmm. it you, you'll have more time uh before invasive species can dig through yeah um, and then two layers of really thick asphaltic uh paper of some uh, felt not paper okay, so, felt yeah, paper right yeah so uh number 15 15 pound or different as i said yep. so i use two layers of 15 pound felt um and then when you say that's really heavy, there's heavier. But yeah, there 15 is heavier. pound is sort of the threshold before workability becomes a problem. Oh, interesting. You can't bend 30 pound around a corner. Mm -hmm. So the, the 15, detailing is going to be another product. Mm -hmm. 15 bends pretty well. And doing two layers, um, you know, that means that a... Uh, a failure yeah. in the first layer is not mm -hmm. going to get past the second let's say that's right and yeah. it, and because this is loose it provides a lot of drying capability mm -hmm. uh, it's not a single layer the the fact that it has some wrinkles and folds and laps and things like that promotes a lot of drying within yeah. that material Smart. so it, you know shingle drains down to the bottom and then i've got big open weep holes in my masonry Love above it. windows and at the ground and then talk to me about penetrations what'd you do for sill pans on windows or um you know did you use a flanged window did you mm -hmm. use a flangeless european style window yeah uh, mine are really high-end wood windows okay. so they don't have a flange on them got it um but here's the funny thing so when a window in any thing, office building, single family home, I don't care what it is. If a window doesn't have a flange, you have to make one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the flanged window is not a downgrade. If you're thinking, you know, my window 
came from Home Depot and it's got a, a flange and that in, implies it's not a fancy European one. Right. Well, the fancy European one has to made, be made to work like the Home Depot uh, flanged window because yep. that is the idea. Fancy tapes or whatever to make a flange out of it. Yeah, but the, the flange is the perfect shape because mm -hmm. it's a flat object that's going to go onto a flat object and yep. that is an easy seal. For that's sure. a lap seam. Mm -hmm. You bed that in sealant, which is required by the standards, right? Yep. It, that's universal. Yet we still find that in failure investigation, we can drive a screwdriver behind the flange and there's no sealant. That's a fail. Mm. Um, but it's the it's the perfect geometry. And when we don't have that, we're fighting to recreate it somehow with sheet metal or tape or something mm -hmm. because we want to seal that gap around you know, this three dimensional object is going into a two dimensional sheathing plane mm. and you have to marry those somehow. It's hard. It's hard with tapes. It's a little easier with liquid flashings, mm -hmm. um, but even those only work on certain dimensions. And then mm. we, you know, we, on commercial, you know, reskinning a building that doesn't have flashings like that around it, we're creating them. Mm -hmm. It's. You know, we're, we're making were those, them out of were those products know. around 20 years ago when you were building your house, the liquid flashings? I, I hadn't known about them until the last 10 years or so, but I didn't know how long they've been on the marketplace. There were some, but the, the products that I used on my house, um, I used a, um, a butyl based product and it is still available. It's the same product and okay. it was very good at the time. And so uh, there are, it has more competitors now. I think mm -hmm. it was probably the first at the time. And so your butyl based product that you used, is that actually adhering to the felt paper as well? It can, but I think it went in first at everywhere except the cell. Um, so because you don't want to have the uh, felt come up and right. cantilever up in front of all the flashings and everything. But yeah, so you're stopping so, that felt at the uh, at the sill and then yeah. that, uh, some type of pan is being created. So here's another great story about my house so we we did a great mock-up we uh bought pizza for the whole crew and uh we built the entire wall section including putting up the felt putting the window in and everything did a full scale mock-up in the garage and we had a translator there and Ray and I walked through, and this is all on a slideshow, uh, by the way. We captured the whole like thing I'm, in slides, like and I've I gave it this. to the Home Builders Association. Yeah, I feel like previously. I've seen it before. Yeah, so that's available if people want it. But it's, um, it's I think it's called Dave and Ray's <laughs> flashing, you know. <laughs> and but so we walked through this whole thing, and uh, we gave all the guys pizza, and um, and then at the end of it, one of the guys leans over and whispers something to his neighbor. And I said to the translator, go ask him what he said. This is hugely important to uh -huh. me. And he came back and he said, this is really good. We should always do it this way. <laughs> and I was like, that's all I ever wanted. You know? I showed them the right way to flash a window. And they're like, oh, there were no questions or anything. It's like, yeah, that's fine. That's how we'll, we should always we'll do, do it. We'll do it that way from now on. Just, that's so great. Nobody ever showed them the respect of just teaching them yeah. why it's all important, how to layer it, mm -hmm. the sequence that it goes in. And those, I don't know, 20 people that attended, so they all great. go off and hopefully told other people. That's so awesome. <laughs> but, That's I so mean, cool, Dan. I felt so good when that translated, because I was concerned. It's like, you know, I was afraid he was going to come back this and say- This guy's an idiot. Yeah, this this guy's stupid. Is, <laughs> Why are we doing this? Yeah, <laughs> maybe it works on paper, but that doesn't scale up to 70 windows. You know? But no, it went great. And then, you know, the, the, the construction went, fine and that's so awesome um, and 20 years later still mm -hmm. looking great no problems with the house you yeah. only let water in when you invite it in that's right so, so what would you do differently would you do anything differently would you build that house the exact same way david so now I, 20 years later 18 yeah. years later yeah i i um you know we spent two years in design two years in construction we've been there for 18 years so um it has a few things that I would do differently, but they're not related to the envelope or the architecture, mm -hmm. uh, the primary, the structural engineering. We got all that really right. That's I think. awesome. It's a wonderful house to live in. And I feel so, so good. But um, 
you can see the things that I wasn't familiar with. Light switches are a constant frustration. Are they? You know, it's like, well, we needed some more of these mm -hmm. <laughs> because you walk into a room and then you just go, nope, nope, nope. It's like, <laughs> damn it. You know, which one <laughs> turns on the kitchen light? That was out of your area of expertise. Yeah, I, I well, it's what I put on the drawing. I mean, I was like, I, you know, I uh, approved those for That's everyone hilarious. where it is, but it's like, why didn't we put a switch for the outside by the front door? You know, it's like, what What was I thinking that day? Yeah. But not my field of expertise. I've only designed one house. and <laughs> Some of those things could be retrofitted. There are a few products in the market that could, uh, you know, put that switch where you want it with Bluetooth technology these days. Yeah, we've got one. Even for, batteries. We have one of those that uh, it looks just like a wall switch, but it's yeah. uh, no wires. I think it's that Lutron Caseta yeah. uh, makes that and some other people make yeah, it too. We did that for an added one. Yeah. What have we missed on the envelope, David? What, um, you and I kind of uh, made a bit of an outline on what we're going to talk about. And I know I varied from that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I love hearing your decades of wisdom from failures and bringing that into uh, doing it right. And, and mm -hmm. frankly, if people listening to this got no other story, but mm -hmm. your cost of doing it right the first time versus the cost of failing right. you, later. You actually had that's, a, something on the outline about that, you know, what is uh, the cost of a good building envelope? Yeah. And what is the cost of a bad building envelope? Because I mean, that's what people really regret is that they're, they're not presented with the rational choice. Mm -hmm. We try to frame our peer reviews. When we do a design review before construction, we try and frame it in terms of life cycle cost mm -hmm. what, um, and tell people what um, what it's going to mean to them if they're going to continue to own this property. Yep. So take the simplest example. Uh, we will typically advocate for stainless steel flashings instead of um, galvanized. galvanized. Galvanized in Texas is good for about 10 years in a concealed wall cavity. Is that right? And then it develops gracious. Uh, corrosion. Only 10 years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe more or less, it depends on detailing, how much drying it gets. There, there might be a range of variables, but in the typical building that we're reviewing, we would expect that to have to be replaced in about year 10. Wow. And some of these builders or developers are planning to to build this as an investment property, if they're if they're paying for a peer review and monitoring the construction, this is usually a buy and hold type situation, situation yeah. right? They're they're investing up front, um, and so they they or they've been burnt, right? They had mm -hmm. a failure, and they're like, I never want this to happen. So yeah. that's our client base is either in institutional investors that or, are or building stuff to keep, a problem. or people that <laughs> already had been through this, and I was like, never want that to happen again. Yeah. What, what do we do differently? Yeah. And so we have uh, some great builder clients that are like that. They're like, no water, no <laughs> water totally. costs us. And so we're willing to spend more on the mm -hmm. construction to prevent it. And by the way, everything I recommend does cost more. Yeah, I have learned no money saving tips in 35 years of practice. I'm sorry, but yeah. that is the reality where our tagline is the durability experts, not the discount experts. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about durability, it is usually upgrades and the galvanizing is, is a great example uh, for a teaching example mm -hmm. because it costs more for stainless steel. But somebody's going to be paying for that in 10 years yeah if it's going to be you you will wish that you'd put it in because it doesn't cost just a dollar a linear foot more it costs 300 dollars a foot to remove the masonry and put in the new flashing and rebuild the waterproofing and correct all the damage that occurred because you found out that it was so corroded expensive. because you got a leak yeah. right and so that the average cost on bids for correcting that is three hundred dollars mm. on the airfoot. The cost upgrade initially in year one is three dollars a linear yeah, foot. Yeah, <laughs> buck or two. You know, it's a really it's, pretty it's cheap. a no brainer. Mm. And yet, people faced with that go, "Well, I just can't afford." It. And it puts the whole project over mm. budget if we do that or the different waterproofing membranes. Yeah. And so, I usually try to get that before we work for a new client mm -hmm. i use that example yep. i was like I, I tell them you know every if you hire us everything i tell you is going to cost more mm -hmm. or is that okay because yep. if you're just going to say 
I can't afford it. I can't afford it. Then take that money you're right. going to pay me and put it into one of the most important things, you know, using some better materials. Yeah. It would be a better investment than right. just getting a report that and, says and smart labor to put those materials in. Yeah, right. Because right. the best the best materials are nothing if we have bad labor, right? Uh, or un um, untrained labor is really the better word. Yeah, the, uh, who or uneducated because you know the best building materials in the world if they're put in incorrectly. Right. We've all seen every manufacturer's product, no matter how good it was, installed incorrectly and cause a failure. Yeah. And it had really nothing to do with the product. It was all about. The labor I, I've said about windows over the years when people have asked me that, and I, I, I just pulled this number out of the air, but I think that when it comes to window leaks, mm. 80% of the leaks are probably an install issue and not necessarily the window itself. Uh, you know, yeah, there's definitely some windows that leak um, and a lot of windows leak in those bottom corners. But if we install them correctly, we can mitigate that so that we'll never know that we had a leak. Um, but so uh, many failures on bad installs. We could go down a rabbit hole on that, but we've tested a lot of windows that leak right off the truck. I've heard that too. And, it, and uh, it's a problem for multifamily the, people, especially. It's a problem in the industry. And mm -hmm. so our builder clients, we recommend that they take delivery and before they install it, mm -hmm. put it up on two saw horses, get Make it a wet. Leak test. And if you see water in the dirt under it, don't install that one. It it's ain't going to get better installed than I know, that. I know a multifamily guy in the Pacific Northwest, Walsh Construction. Mm -hmm. You probably have heard them speak before. Mm -hmm. uh, Marty, I forget his last name. I've heard him speak at science, building science camps. And he said they do that when they get 200 windows in for a multifamily job. They tape the weeps. Mm -hmm. They fill them with uh, some red dyed uh, water. Mm -hmm. And they send invariably... 30% of the windows back or something. Yep. And then they get 30 new windows and they test those and they send six back. <laughs> right. And then they get those and they have send one back and now they've got a batch of right. 230 windows for the building. They but don't I, I call it the sawhorse test. This, you don't need to hire an accredited testing lab to come do this. You don't have to monitor it full time. You just, one at a time, you have a laborer, set them on sawhorses, get it all wet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you put something under it so you can see if water drips through. And, it's a it's just a production line but you're not sitting there watching it yep you know you just but before that window gets installed you check underneath it and go you know it's super it, smart this one didn't leak um and uh it's it's not free but it's pretty cheap yeah it's pretty cheap and it's great insurance but you, you definitely would want to know that before you go to all the the labor to install it in the building because taking that back out again much oh, more expensive. So expensive. Mm -hmm. So expensive. Actually, uh, when you were talking about the galvanized flashings in there, 10-year mm -hmm. uh, lifespan, I remember seeing on a job, I don't know, five or 10 years ago, that was a, a remodel project that was all, only a few years old. I was shocked that the, the door sill pans, the builder had taken the time to make galvanized sill pans sitting on a concrete slab after just a few years. They were really rusty. Yeah. Is that common out there everywhere yeah. that so, that uh, when that concrete is touching that galvanized, it really tends yeah. to uh, rust them out? And, or, you know, is it because of the reaction with concrete or just sitting in water? That's a, that environment is is pretty harsh mm -hmm. already. And so, um, but let's be careful here. Galvanizing, we still specify in a commercial environment mm -hmm. as a solution to a, a lot of things. Yep. But we're talking about sheet metals that are a commodity product you're mm -hmm. buying a piece of flat you know Stock. 20 gauge right. sheet metal that's galvanized with or just the barest amount of more zinc. like 24 or 26 gauge yeah, that. right and so there's very little corrosion protection on that product yeah, yeah you could you know on we put in structural steel into office buildings that is galvanized that's but a that is deal. hot dip right. galvanized with a thick yeah, coating on with there. a specified and measured thickness of zinc mm -hmm. and it's got a calculable life right and but we're, we're that's not the hmm. type of galvanizing we're talking about right. here this is an electroplated thing that's made in a in, as a economical commodity product and yep. it's fine for a lot of things uh, you know most of that stuff is used 
in, in, in an application where that's not critical. What I'm talking about is a through wall, like on a house or an mm -hmm. apartment building, mm -hmm. bending that into a Z shape and then lapping it. And you can do everything right and you'll still get pinholes in yep. there in a relatively short time. Just a few years. And it, it doesn't have to be defectively constructed. It's just uh, imperfect, yeah. right? So yeah. some water is sitting on it. It's not all draining out. And so it gets wet. And that's should be okay for a flashing material. Mm -hmm. right? Should be able to get wet. Yeah. How about uh, how about those stainless flashings that are of that same 24, 26, 28 gauge uh, commodity flashings? Is that stainless of a quality that would last twice as long or three times as long? Oh, I think even, even more than that. We do have, I have one article that's out there on stainless uh, failures, but that's, it kind of an exotic thing where you're getting reactions it, it th that behavior is very complex yeah and it was more like in this failure investigation what happened why did we get corrosion of mm -hmm. stainless steel it can happen but that's not going to happen within the normal life of a spec home or right. a, a, um or multifamily construction yeah. they yeah. should last the life of those buildings but we're not talking about institutional construction there mm -hmm. you'd want to go to copper and things like that right, right. We're, we're talking about things that are have an economic life of 30 or 50 years yeah, yeah that's that very sense. hard to define by the way <laughs> what is that life right yeah and how long should it last yeah and so yeah. a lot of my talks so we um, we start with that that how ever nobody's thought about it until there's a failure and then mm -hmm. they say well I, this was supposed to last 100 years well Nothing you chose is consistent with a hundred year mm -hmm. life. There's no evidence that that was the design intent. Right. <laughs> and it's just when it fails prematurely that we're trying to define what the expectation was. Yeah. And what it ultimately gets defined by is lawyers mm -hmm. in the settlement as to what <laughs> what they what they lost, what they should have had. Painful. And, yeah. It's painful much better if you state right up front like you know on architectural drawings it'll say the code is this building code mm -hmm. should say right under that the design life of this facility yeah is that's right know, 50 years yeah everybody should be making decisions consistent with that number Man, that'd be so but cool it, wouldn't they it they don't that'd they be so it. cool that'd be so interesting if i had a client who came to me and said hey man i'm looking to build a house that would have a Last service life of 100 years mm -hmm. or you pass know, it on to my kids it's going to be a, yeah. for generations what, yeah you or you've seen it? joe stebrick's uh 500 year house article probably before mm -hmm. from building science corporation what would we do differently you know we for loves, building for we loves us some joe stebrick <laughs> if we're building for 500 years or even 100 years uh, I'm building mm -hmm. my current family house mm -hmm. uh, and I expect to be there at least 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I did was I put a more expensive metal roof on because mm -hmm. I don't want to replace my roof when the hail comes through and kills my asphalt shingles. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, will that roof make it to 50 years? I don't know for sure, but I know for sure that's a more durable, long lasting roof than a standard asphalt roof. Right. That's and typical so that was, of institutional construction. Mm -hmm. you, you don't build a university building with a shingle roof that's right right so why is it not okay there is yeah. the architecture you know you could do shingles if they're slight yeah and then there's right. thick pieces of stone of actual real stone that's uv resistant and real slate uh -huh. not the not the not rubber stones slate. that were left over <laughs> yeah, that's right gosh david we've taken a lot of your time i can't thank you enough for uh taking some time to come out and talk to us about the building envelope any last closing thoughts that you missed or anything that you wanted to mention that uh, that i didn't get to today i don't know let's check the agenda here we, we, and the <laughs> other thing too david i'd love for i'd love for you to uh if you can um uh, tell us how we could find some of the articles that your company, your colleagues that you've written, some of the stuff that's come out of the durability lab. How can people find that? Yeah. So that's one of these, right? So we would love for people to go to our website okay. and they, there are links to articles and that's buildingdx.com. Buildingdx.com. Okay. Yeah. We'll put a link in our show notes of that. Diagnostics. And happy to have people go do that. However, we get a lot of uh, emails from people saying, I'm building my house. I wonder if you can advise. And I just can't respond yeah. to those. I try to, but it's like fan mail. I'd love to, but mm -hmm. the reality is I can't keep up with 
the the client the business email <laughs> and so yeah. i would love to be engaged with every one of those people and uh, i do try to reply or at least i see this article yeah. but um i you know if i don't reply <laughs> to somebody i'm not dissing them we won't hold it against you don't worry i'm trying but i have over 200 unread emails right now when i left to come up here oh man and i've there's some that are billable and some that are non-billable. Yeah. I got a triage. That. I know how so, that goes. So I, sure, I would David. love to be just academic all the time, but yeah. I'm also uh, running a complex business. Yes, you are. Kind of busy. I really so. appreciate you taking an hour to uh, to podcast with me, David. I mean, I think some of the things that we talked about today are super valuable, whether you're an old builder, a young builder, whether you're someone who's thinking about building a house. Uh, take some of David's advice in terms of thinking long term, thinking about the things that really matter and spending the time and effort up front before it's built rather than spending the effort to uh, to make a forensic uh, change or um, uh, or or a maintenance change even later. Because a little bit of time and effort spent up front means that David's built a house that 20 years later is a great house that he, he wants to change a couple light switches and that's about it <laughs> that's right. uh and that's what i'm hoping to do with my house too right i want a house that i'm going to live in and raise my kids in and uh enjoy and maybe pass on to a future generation um and they'll change the kitchen because it's gone out of style but they won't need to remodel because there's been mold or rot or because there's been problems in the house. Mm-hmm. And that really gets me excited. So with that being said, guys, big thanks to David for uh, for joining us. If you're not already a subscriber here at the Build Show podcast, hit that subscribe button. We've got new podcast episodes out every single Friday. Follow me on Twitter or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show. Build Show.